Hey everybody, it's Teardown Time again. Uh, today on the bench we have a TIAC RD111T PCM data recorder. Now what this is um, essentially is a data recorder. Um, it dates from sometime in the 1990s, um, probably early 1990s I guess. And what this allows you to do is to record eight discrete uh, analog channels um, onto uh, tape. Now the tape in question is actually um, DAT tape. So if you remember DAT from the uh, late 80s and early 90s um, and up, up until the noughties really um, because it was later used as um, data storage rather than audio tape. Um, so it uses DAT tapes to record the uh, the eight channels on. Um, obviously what is recorded on here is not compatible with a, a DAT machine, um, it's its own proprietary format. So as I mentioned it has uh, eight inputs and it has eight outputs as well. Um, obviously to play it back uh, you simply rewind, find the event that you've created and uh, play it back and what went into the input uh, comes out the outputs. Quite simple really. So it allows you to um, record uh, Back in the days before you had uh, solid state recording and uh, little uh, microcontroller based data loggers, um, this is probably the sort of thing you would have used if you wanted to uh, try and um, data log multiple channel channels of uh, analog um, or indeed digital data. So let's have a quick look around this unit then. Um, on the front panel uh, we have uh, all the user controls and the inputs and outputs. Um, across the top here we have the tape transport controls, rewind, fast forward, forward which is effectively play, um, stop, record, pause and eject, um, all fairly logical things to have on a, a tape device. Uh, we have input range control um, attenuators on here so you can um, switch this to be uh, plus minus 2 volt input so that's um, 4 volt peak to peak. Um, or they can be switched with an attenuator in to make it um, uh, 40 volts peak to peak. So you can just select which channels you want in, in which particular range. Um, just on the, uh, on the left here you have uh, a remote control port. Um, this would uh, be um, linked on to a, uh, a small handheld device, wired obviously, which would give you the tape transport controls and um, a copy of the the front panel display. Um, you also have here uh, memo in and memo out. Um, that is a separate discrete channel, effectively channel 9 if you like, um, which allows you to record um, just audio. Um, so while you're data logging you can actually make commentary um, and have that recorded at the same time as the eight channels of, uh, of data. Uh, next to that you have a speaker volume control uh, which allows you to listen to um, either the uh, the memo channel or you can actually listen to any of the uh, the channels on the inputs as well so if you have uh, uh, various analog signals you can actually listen to them through the speaker. Uh, in the middle we have uh, all the inputs and outputs uh, so we've got uh, channel 1 to channel 8 input and then output at the bottom. Um, I believe these are 50 ohm but I've not had that confirmed and just on the uh, the other side here we have a, uh, a small uh, VU bar graph display for the levels of the eight input channels and M is the monitor channel which is the, the, men the memo channel. We have tape counter uh, which can work in absolute position i.e. from the start of the tape or you can have it per event which is what the P means so A is absolute, P is program as they call it. Um, there is a, an event ID, uh, so every time you uh, press stop and start recording again, the ID increments um, automatically. So when you're playing back and searching, you can easily find events um, that uh, you've made, made notes of. You can also um, force an event to be recorded uh, onto the tape as well, and that just adds an ID and just increments up to uh, 99, I believe. And just next to that we have a clock. Uh, this uh, is the date, time, um, 
This is uh, battery backed and this is actually encoded onto the tape as you're recording. And we have some ID search buttons here. So as I said, when you're playing back, you're able to, um, if you've made notes that um, ID 34 was one of particular interest, you can uh, press play and then punch in 34 and it would, uh, it would go and find that ID. Just on the right here, we have uh, monitor out. Um, this is the monitor output, um, so you can select this to um, output one of the eight channels onto a separate output to go to, off to uh, whatever you want really, oscilloscope or an amplifier or something. So this just allows you to monitor any of the, uh, the actual input channels. And power switch. And round on the side, we have um, the power input. So that's a standard IEC um, connector on there. Um, it uh, runs AC uh, 180 to 250 volts, which is a bit of an odd, odd range to have really. Um, we have um, a port here which is um, which is shown as two GP300. Now this is an external battery pack, which you can use with this device. Um, so you can be completely uh, separated from the uh, from any need to um, plug it into the mains. You can be totally totally battery powered. And um, under these two ports are um, an optical data in and an optical data out port as well. A bit further around on the back, we have uh, some nice rubber feet, which allows you to. Uh, to actually stand this on its end, which is, uh, which is very nice. Uh, we have a DC input port, uh, which will run from uh, 11 to 30 volts. We have a ground port, grounding connection, and a reset button. Uh, I'm not really sure what that does, to be honest. And on the top, we've got a nice carrying handle and a tilting bale underneath. Lastly, we have the top, which has the um, tape um, cassette door, and we have a little door here, which under here is the most crazy way I've seen to set the date and time ever. Um, instead of using the front panel controls to uh, set the date and time, what you do is um, adjust these um, decimal um, encoders, um, to the what is the correct date and time and then you press the set date and time button um, and then that's it you just then close it and it remembers it because it ha has a battery in but it seems an absolute overkill to uh, to actually fit all of these uh, little encoders um, just to set the date and time seems crazy to me that there we go right I can actually show you this uh, working in operation I do have a tape here that I can uh, I can put in this. Now this has obviously a, a been a fairly well used unit and it does have some dicky contacts in the uh, the tape transport so uh, sometimes it, it, it can be a bit funny um, a bit like that. No! Right I've got this set up here I have my signal generator Outputting a 100 hertz uh, triangle um, wave at 2 volts peak to peak. That's going into um, channel 2. Um, channel 2 is then coming out and into my scope. So if I press uh, record, it, um, it goes into a record pause mode. Um, it does actually um, put uh, like a start marker down as well. So we have the output of the, um, the signal generator here coming out the output of, of this. So we can uh, press forward and that now starts to record all of these eight channels. So I can actually swap this um, onto channel three. And you should just be able to see here um, the little bar graphs. Um, you can see the M moving here, hopefully, and it might be a bit faint. Um, but that is actually recording the audio that's actually in the room as well. There's a small microphone just down here on the front panel. So I can move that to, uh, to 
there and we get the triangle wave again. I could change that to a square wave. Oh, look at that nasty. Oh, um, let's try a sine wave. We'll put that on channel four. Now, as I said um, before, um, there is actually a monitor port on here. So this is probably the best place to plug this in because it means I can actually change the uh, change the channel using this uh, monitor knob. So on channel four, we have the, uh, the sine wave updating again. So I can increase the frequency of that. This, now I believe um, there is about uh, two and a half kilohertz of uh, bandwidth on each of these channels. So not a lot. Now, I, earlier I did mention that it does have a speaker as well, so uh, what I can actually do here is turn up the volume and pull out this knob, and it allows me to monitor any of these eight ports using, using the monitor port here. So, at the moment you should be able to hear that, which is a uh, 1.4 kilohertz sine wave. So, I could change that to a triangle. So if that was on channel 5, I could uh, have it on there and then change this to channel 5. So this has all been recorded in, uh, in real time. Okay, let's stop that. We'll uh, rewind. And we can play that back. So you can hear that uh, it's recorded the audio that's in the room, but it's also recorded the eight, the eight channels. So on the output, I can actually change this. I've got an output on channel three. So you can see here we have a live output from the actual data that's coming from uh, channel three at the moment. Right, to get inside this, uh, we just have to remove the top cover, the tape door, the BNC um, connections on the front here, and the bottom panel, and then I'll be right back. Okay, you can see here I've just removed the top cover. Um, they are, it's just a, uh, a stamped out uh, aluminium, aluminium cover. You can see on the top, top cover here, we have the, uh, the speaker and a connection there that goes down onto the circuit board. And uh, uh, first thing to note is the, uh, the tape transport mechanism, which is this, uh, this unit just here. Uh, we have a small control circuit board for it and the actual uh, mechanical drive here. Uh, we have a, a PCB over here with a whole load of uh, connections on it. Um, there is another one below as well with even more connections on it. Um, an interesting large capacitor over there. And we have the power supply right at the back. And then underneath, we have uh, an, a large PCB. Um, again, a whole load of connections all over this. Um, but this is the, um, you can see there, it's, it's labeled um, ADDA. So this is the um, analog to digital converter and the digital to analog converter. So this is the bit that, that converts the inputs and outputs to, um, to digital and analog and back and forth, etc. So we'll just have a look at the top section first. So this board is labelled um, sub 2. Um, given that uh, there is the date and time setting controls on here, this may be something to do with the clock and things like that. Uh, these two devices here are MC14053 BCPs. They are analog multiplexers and demultiplexers. Not a huge amount going on on that. I'm not really sure what that's doing. All right, let's take this. Uh, let's take this board out. Right, I've just removed all the screws, so it's uh, it's actually loose now. So I'm just going to release some of these uh, these connections, so we can actually flip it over. Wow, it's uh, it's seven four series heaven. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to look all them up. Um, there's a lot of them. Um, these are all surface mount, unlike. Like this board, which is all through hole, um, this one is a mixture of uh, surface mount and through hole. 
Um, okay, so we've got a whole load of 7.4 series logic here. We've got uh, an EPROM over there. With a, uh, we have a, um, a battery. This is a, looks like it's a rechargeable one. Uh, Saft, yeah, it's a very popular brand back in the back in the 90s and 80s for rechargeable batteries. Uh, we have a Sharp RH IX14161 AFZZ. Uh, I can't find anything on that at all. Uh, we have um, this device, which is labelled RTC, so I guess that's um, that's the clock and calendar, and 74HC. 597, 597, 597, 597, 597, 597. They are 8-bit serial parallel um, serial output shift registers. Uh, we have a small device here, which is another sharp, which is LR3716M. And this here is actually a, uh, a remote control transmitter. Um, developed for use in infrared remote control transmitters. So it's um, odd seeing that there. I wonder whether they're, maybe they're using that to doing some sort of encoding or something, uh, but not actually used as infrared. Right, so this is looking at the um, um, analog digital conversion board. Um, looking through down underneath here, I can see that this connector comes from the input um, connector and this one goes to the output. So um, I'm gonna sort of hazard a guess that probably this bit over here is the analog input, and this is the uh, analog output. So the inputs come in, they go through some um, LF412CNs, which are op amps. We've got one, two, three, four of those. Um, then further on from that, we have 4053BF. We have four of those as well. Um, these are actually uh, multiplexers. Um, can't see immediately how, how many channels and stuff they are, but um, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five of those in this area, but there's four op amps, so I'm guessing that the inputs come into here and get split into, um, into four. Um, next up here we have some Toshiba TD 6704Ps. These are um, basically the same kind of uh, analog to digital converter you would find in a DAC machine, um, a DAC recorder. Uh, they are 16-bit stereo, um, 48 kilohertz sampling, um, so exactly the same spec that you'd find in a, um, a DAC recorder. Um, they've got, obviously got two of them, um, so that would give you a total of four discrete channels. So I think what they're doing here, they're bringing the, the eight inputs in and, um, and then multiplexing them um, into these two um, ADCs to then create um, the complete overall bitstream. Quite an interesting solution that, given that they've just used off-the-shelf uh, parts um, to give you eight discrete channels, even though there is actually, um, they're using parts which are actually only um, stereo, so they've got, uh, as I said, four channel, four discrete channels, and they'll be multiplexing them, um, which I guess is probably what all that logic was on the on the other board. Um, it's doing lots of switching between um, the analog inputs and uh, switching them into the at the right point, um, so they can all be encoded into the data stream. So moving on over this side, we have. Um, a bit more analog circuitry. Uh, we have some Burr Brown PCM 56Ps, and these are um, digital to analog converters, 16 bit um, serial input. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those. So that would be uh, logical, um, given we've got eight outputs. So interestingly, Instead of uh, trying to do the same as, as they did on the inputs, they've actually got um, eight discrete um, uh, digital to analog converters on the outputs. Uh, and that runs into a whole load of, you've got some more logic here. Uh, we've got these modules here, which are labeled U. Um, I can't quite see the part number on that because there's a capacitor in the way. That looks like some kind of hybrid 
hybrid thing. Uh, we've got another little board mounted on here. Um, I'm guessing given these are all uh, digital to analog, there's probably some filtering and all sorts of stuff going on here before it's sent to the actual outputs. No, there's a whole load of adjustment pots on here. Uh, we've got uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30. There's 30 adjustment knobs on this board alone. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of relays up here um, and some uh, other data connections that I would suspect is probably the, the actual data input and output from um, the actual um, drive itself. Um, and the rest will be control lines. Now, interesting in here, there's, uh, there's a couple of hinges here and a little pull tab, so I wonder whether this actually folds out. Let's see if there's anything underneath it. Yeah, I've just uh, removed the screws out of uh, this and it does actually hinge up, but there's not actually enough slack on the wires to actually allow it to come all the way, so I'm just going to have to disconnect these. Wow. <laughs> Why is anybody? Um, blimey. Right, it's a bit of a mess of wires. Um, we've got some interesting connections here. A little bit bodgy, that. We've got wires soldered onto the back of a PCB mount socket and then plugged in. Cable plugged into it. Um, so we take a look over this side first. Uh, looks like we've got some power supply stuff going on over here with all the big caps. Um, we've got, that's one of the optical data inputs or outputs. Another one there. We've got a sealed metal can just there. Not sure what that is. Uh, we've got some large um, through hole devices here, which are MB, they are MB8464A-10L, um, oh, those, those might be some kind of RAM actually. Yes, those are 64 uh, bit, sorry, 64 kilobit um, static RAM, so there's two of those. Um, just down here we have um, Sharp LR38111B. They are slightly different, all of these. There's one, two, three, four that look the similar. Um, we've got three that are really similar. One is um, 3611B. We've got the th 38113, and we have a 38112. And I don't get anything at all on these, uh, so I haven't a clue what those are for. And just over here, we have another of those... Uh, Similar, similar devices. That's an LR three eight one one four. And under here we have uh, an IR three R three seven. These are all sharp branded ICs. And there's uh, there's nothing on that one either. And down in this corner we have another sharp, which is an X one four one five AF. And uh, there's nothing on that one either. Uh, interesting, these uh, these ICs are actually dated. Uh, this is 1987, 1987. That's 1990. Uh, and the ones over here are 1990 as well. So it's interesting. There's there's some obviously some old devices in here. And there's whole loads of little wires, and uh, I wouldn't, you know, I'm not sure whether they're bodges or intentional. There's uh, there's sort of various link wires and stuff on the PCB, but they actually do go to um, to actual proper solder pads. They're not just tagged on to uh, random components. So they look intentional. It does look all a bit Heath Robinson in here, to be honest, with these uh, these little connectors, where they just sold the wire, soldered the wire to, um, to PCB mount connectors. Right, I'm just going to close all this up and uh, we'll have a quick look at the tape transport. This is of course based on a DAT drive, so 
I would imagine this is probably just an off-the-shelf drive unit that they've uh, they bought in. Uh, that's why the uh, the PCB and everything looks slightly different. Um, we've got a little control board over at the back with uh, some adjustment pots on. Um, a load of wires connecting to, into the actual mechanical transport. Um, we've got the the loading the tape cassette loading here. If we just eject that, there's a small. Um, this bit here is actually the door release. There's actually a small solenoid down in here. So when you press the eject button, you probably can't see it. It's just down, just down in here. It's uh, it's only on a very quick little solenoid that just releases the the tape door. Um, we've got some flat flex running over to uh, a few different um, push switches which identify what type of tape it is, um, whether it's right, ena right enabled and uh, whether there's a tape actually in the drive etc. And just a bit further back you can see the, uh, the actual drive wheels and then if I close this down you can see some of the actual um, mechanics that pull the tape around the around the head. So from this angle, you can see the um, the head drum um, and a few uh, analog wires coming off it into little shielded cans. Um, got uh, some of the tape transport under that. Check this. So there, looking in from the back, you can see the uh, tape transport a little bit better. Now, if you don't know about DAT, then um, this actually uses a, um, a four millimeter tape. Now, this uh, uses a helical scan, uh, which is similar to uh, uh, old VHS tapes, where you'd have a spinning head, um, and the tape is um, is drawn across it, um, and the the actual data is recorded on in in sort of diagonal diagonal fashion. Um, it's a more compact recording method. Um, it's also recorded completely digitally onto um, onto the tape, whereas VHS was uh, an analog format. So if I just load in uh, the tape that I've got here into the into the drive, and then just close the lid down, it is a bit dark in there. I'm afraid I'm having to use a torch. Um, but you can see there it's pulled the tape partly around the uh, the head. Now interestingly um, on the DAT format um, it um, only draws the tape only around a very very small part of the actual um, the head. With VHS and other formats like this um, they tended to draw the tape um, almost all the way around the head um, especially on uh, uh, things like Umatic which is a, a um, a much much larger system than VHS, huge heads on them. Um, the tape would almost go uh, almost 100, uh, 360 degrees around the, the around the, the tape, um, which meant it uh, was a bit less reliable in this way. So there's there's less contact on the tape, makes the tape last longer, the heads last longer, and uh, it also means that uh, the head can be shrunk in size. Um, this is about the size of uh, what well, I don't know. I, Probably about 35 millimeters in diameter, something like that. And the uh, the other benefit to having a, a small head is uh, there's less inertia in it. So if you have a portable device, um, as it's moved around, it's it's less likely to be affected by um, you moving the uh, the device. I don't know whether anybody tried to use a VHS uh, recorder or player in in a car or something. You know, um, as you moved it around, the picture would go all over the place. So, this is less susceptible, um, given that the head is much smaller and there's less mass in the uh, in the head, which uh, certainly helps, and which is why it was used for used in um, portable DAT players and things like that. Now you can see in here, there's uh, there's various little sensors and everything to detect where the tape is, um, where it should be. Um, and um, obviously throw errors out and um, what this tends to do if if there's any sort of fault it just um, unloads the tape from the uh, the actual drive the, the the head it just loads it straight into the tape and uh, and leaves it there so there's little sensors here to detect when the tape is actually pushing up against that there's a little optical optical sensor there there's uh, another optical sensor just in the back here 
there's um, there's a transmitter and receiver on there and it detects for the um, reflection of, of the actual tape there looks to be a temperature sensor here also also on these uh, these drive um, drive spindles, um, I would imagine there's probably optical sensors and optical encoders um, underneath um, all this to actually um, allow the uh, the controller to monitor the speed uh, of of these as it um, expects them to be. And if it sort of drifts out of spec, it can just sort of default to a faulting thing and just unload the tape and just say there's an error. Okay, before I finish up, I just want to make a couple of uh, minor corrections. Uh, I mentioned on the side here there is a, uh, a port for the uh, external battery. This is not the external battery port. The external battery port is the DC input that you saw earlier. Um, this one here is um, an output to a GPIB interface, uh, which was an optional extra, so uh, small correction there. Right, I hope you found that, uh, that interesting, looking at uh, an old data logging relic from the uh, 1990s. Um, it's sort of kind of interesting uh, to see how this is completely an out outgunned and outmoded by modern SD card data loggers that are, you know, a tenth of the size, probably uh, a tenth of the cost, and uh, do a whole better job. So it's really interesting that. Okay, I hope you found this interesting. Um, if you like this, hit the like button. If you're not subscribed, I suggest you subscribe. There's going to be more stuff like this. Um, Right, thanks for watching everybody. I will see you on the next video. Bye for now.